Good morning, and thank you for joining us on the discussion, Establishing Equitable Trauma-Informed Practice in Your School. Just a brief overview before the ladies begin. In this presentation, participants will learn about how to infuse equity-based work into a model of trauma-informed care called the Seven Essential Ingredients, also known as 7EI, developed and practiced at St. A over the last decade. Seven EIs of trauma-informed care has been taught to over 60,000 participants in a variety of community sectors, including education, child welfare, law enforcement, legal parties, mental health, grassroots, and child-serving organizations. This presentation will further enhance this model with a lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion as primary. Participants will learn how the history of historical and racial trauma underlies the experiences of adversity that many Black, Indigenous people of color may experience in traditional educational settings. We will explore how bias plays a role in district policy, school-wide procedures, and classroom practices. Tools will be shared to support schools and educators to explore their own bias and the role it plays in their work. Ideas on how to develop classroom strategies that promote regulation in a collaborative and culturally relevant manner will also be discussed. Approaches to promote trusting relationships and a sense of purpose, belonging for all will be shared. Creating learning environments that value difference in thought and collaboration over individualism will support all students to thrive. Participants will be challenged to explore their own identity, journey and engage in critical self-reflection on how to advance this work in themselves and others within their school district. And now I turn it over to our two speakers, Sarah Daniel and Pamela Hansen. Thank you. I think I get to go first. So uh, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much. It seems like it is warming up in here a little bit. So I'm Sarah Daniel. Um, I'll just do a brief introduction and then I'm going to turn it over to Pam for a little bit. So I'm Sarah Daniel. I'm the Vice President of Educational Services for St. A. I uh, have been doing a lot of work for well, uh, the last decade or so or more in trauma-informed care and working primarily um, in schools and really is trying to understand how we um, support schools to support students to do their best. So um, I've been working with Ms. Hansen here for quite a long time. Uh, so she'll introduce herself and uh, we will take it away. Good morning, everyone. I kind of feel like I'm sound muffled with this. Is it okay for me to take off the mask? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. I was, I was, I was, I was sounding. I didn't, like I didn't like the sound. It wasn't coming out. I'm not a mic check. It was sounding a little unclear. So good morning. My name is Pamela Hansen. I am a school social worker with Milwaukee Public Schools. I've been with Milwaukee Public Schools for over 25 years. Um, probably about 2010 is when we um, kind of started our journey with trauma sensitive schools. Um, Sierra has been an integral part of my learning actually around trauma sensitive schools. So I have to thank her for her teaching. It has been um, enormously helpful for not only myself, but as um, MPS as a district. So um, I am also a licensed clinical social worker um, and do some private practice on the side. Thank you. Um, so, so yeah, so we had a little introduction about kind of what we're going to hope to bring to you in this uh, session. We only do have an hour together, so it's kind of short. So we're going to preview a few things and there, there will be some tools that I can um, share with you. And, um, but we're really going to get an overview. So feel free to um, ask questions, stop us, have um, challenging, you know, conversations or any of that kind of thing. We'll, we'll let Pam kind of get us situated and, and settled into today. So a little, she'll explain. You want this? Okay. So um, I always like to start with um, what I call a mindful moment. It just gives us an opportunity to kind of get ourselves rounded and to be in the present moment. 
So I just have a small practice that we'll just start off our presentation with. So I'm gonna just ask for us to get in our mindful positions. And that is just really allowing yourself to have your feet flat on the floor. And if you can have kind of your hands either in your lap or on your side. And I'm gonna ask that we begin if you're comfortable by closing your eyes, and if you're not comfortable closing your eyes, feel free to just lower your gaze. I'm just gonna ask you to just kind of bring some awareness to your feet and to your legs, and just notice the solid ground beneath them. And then I'm just wanting to ask you to pay attention to your spine and the alignment of your spine. And if you can have that to be nice and long and tall and strong. Release any tension you might have right now in your shoulders. Send your attention now to your face and to your jaw. And if you notice any tension there, I'd ask you just to release that tension from your face and your jaw at this time. Take a nice deep breath in. And then I'll ask you to just let that out slowly. And if you can let your exhale be a little longer than that inhale. I'm gonna ask if you could just kind of gently shake out your arms and your hands, releasing any tension you might have there. bringing our attention back to our legs and our feet. If you could just tighten those muscles for a moment and then let those muscles be released. And then I'm gonna ask you to take another night deep cleansing breath. And again, let that out nice and slowly. Again, releasing any tension you might have, any stress in your body, any anxieties or worries at this time. If you could just let those go. And I'd just like you to take a moment to just appreciate the wonder of our bodies. And when you're ready, you may lift your gaze or you may open your eyes. And I thank you for participating in our mindful moment. Thank you. Um, anybody else want to just Zen, kind of relax for the rest of the day. We'll, we'll do that work. Um, so I want to start today with um, just kind of offering a um, model or a way in which we often start our conversations or try to work our conversations in schools around um, how we layer on a, a, a lens of equity onto our trauma-sensitive work. So this is going to make an assumption that many of our schools have done a lot of work in trauma-sensitive work. They're not perfect, they're not completed, um, but there is an awareness there. And so this is about the, the approach that Pam and I take when we come at this work is not um, to say we're going to have kind of in a school our trauma-sensitive committee over here that's doing the trauma sensitive work and then we're going to have a social emotional learning over here and then we're going to have our um, culturally responsive and equity work over here it's really about how do we uh, layer these and integrate these conversations and so we we borrow from um, courageous conversations about race Glenn Singleton's work um, to stay engaged speak your truth um, experience discomfort and expect and accept non uh, non closure. You know, it's not going to be wrapped up in a bowl with here's your idea or here's your strategies that are um, going to make this, you know, uh, give us the solution. Right? It's it's about a continuous journey and a continuous conversation. So we like to also play this um, video too. And I have to go over and um, put the speaker by the or the microphone by the speaker just. So forgive that, just so that the people that are watching virtually can uh, hear it too. So this is Amanda Kemp, and she has some um, really wise words to say about setting the conversation about discussions and race and equity. So we'll have you listen to her and then reflect on, you know, what do you think? What do you think about what she says? Do you accept it? Do you reject it? Um, are there parts of it you like, parts of it you don't? So can you click play when I get over there? I think that I can. Yeah. 
imagine a conversation from your everyday life, a scene from your everyday life, a staff meeting, dinner with friends, a family holiday. The conversation turns to disagreement about race or racism. Instead of getting tense and losing your breath, you breathe deeper, relax, and lean in. By the time the dinner is done or the meeting is over, you feel peaceful, relaxed, and connected. Now, this might sound far-fetched, but what if I told you it's absolutely possible if you're willing to practice holding space for transformation? As a college professor, racial justice mentor, and author, when I ask people, why is it so hard to have conversations across the color line about race, there are two common responses. From whites, afraid to say the wrong thing. From people of color, exhaustion. Holding space for transformation gives you a way to have conversations across the color line without getting exhausted and without being overcome by fear. Neona Spans defines holding space for transformation as being unconditional love and unconditional acceptance. And in my book, I add, while standing in the ground of your values for justice, inclusion, or whatever they might be. What I love about holding space for transformation is that it takes a, it shifts the conversation from being a debate with winners and losers to being more of a journey, a discovery of blind spots, assumptions, connections, and compassion. What I know from almost 30 years of teaching, writing, and performing for racial justice is that most people don't change their don't change based on facts. They change based on feelings, stories, and human connection. So for conversations about race to be productive, we need more than an open mind. We need a whole new context, the context of unconditional love and unconditional acceptance. So today, I want to share with you how you can hold space for transformation in your everyday interactions, where by bringing, being heartfully and mindfully present, you can generate more peace and understanding with your neighbors in your community. I would argue that this is more important at this moment in 2017, when our nation is so divided and false dichotomies abound. History shows us that when we fall into us versus them thinking, when we demonize whole groups of people, we're laying the groundwork for spirals of violence, slavery, and even genocide. So with those stakes, let's take a closer look at what it means to hold space the transformation. Let me start by saying what is not. It is not about agreeing with someone. In fact, it's most important to hold space when you disagree. Similarly, it's not about liking someone. Holding space to transformation is more like reminding yourself to allow unconditional love and unconditional acceptance to flow through you. And finally, it's not about suppressing your feelings. If you're feeling flooded by anger, sadness, or hurt, then that is not a good time for you to practice holding space for transformation. Let me show you how it would work in a conversation. Just imagine that someone says something that reflects their bias. Before you say anything to the other person, you get your feet on the ground, take a deep breath, roll your shoulders down, and check in with yourself. Are you feeling hungry, tired, or hurt? 
If you are, then this might not be the time for you to hold space for transformation. You can try it another time. But when you check in and if you find yourself feeling stable, grounded, then go ahead and set the intention to be unconditional love and unconditional acceptance. Only after you've done this would I suggest you engage the other person. And you might ask a question, make a comment, or, or even simply make eye contact. You don't have to scour your brain for something brilliant or insightful to say that will show them the light. Just be with your breath, be with your intention. Whatever comes will be what is needed in that moment. Now you might say, Amanda, if it was that easy, we would not be this stuck. And you're right. Holding space for transformation is simple, but not easy. Ease comes with practice and you can practice by just taking five minutes at the beginning of your day or when you go to sleep, put your feet on the ground, take a deep breath and just intend being unconditional love and unconditional acceptance towards someone you already like. Once you have that sense memory inside your body, you can pull it up in a more difficult situation. Let me give you an example from my personal life. About a year or so ago, a white coworker approached me. He said he wanted to talk to me about Black Lives Matter. He knows what I do. And, um, and I know from hearing over having overheard him that what he really wanted to talk about was white lives should matter more uh, in the conversation that we're having about Black Lives Mattering. So I took a deep breath. I checked in with myself. And I saw that I had the space to be with him. And I realized I had that space because I had been doing all kinds of self-compassion and mindfulness work. So I said, yes, I'll have a conversation with you about this. And I put my feet on the ground and I set the intention to be unconditional love and unconditional acceptance. I mostly listen. I asked a question here or there, and my coworker talked. And as he talked, he slowly began to talk himself out of some of his opinions. He started questioning his news, his news sources. He started to um, wonder, well, maybe he just started to have some openness and some um, uncertainty. I was encouraged by his openness. And so I asked him, would you like to know what it's like for me? He said, yes. So I said, very simply, every time my teenage son leaves the house, I am filled with dread and fear that he will have an interaction with the police and not come back. I don't know if that man will ever show up at a vigil or a rally for Black lives, but I do know that in that conversation, he gained more empathy and understanding for the people behind those kinds of slogans. In conclusion, I want to remind us all that the stakes are really high. People are dying. We absolutely need more justice. And it's not enough to be right. We've got to connect with people who don't already agree with us. Holding space for transformation is a powerful choice. It gives us a way to take care of ourselves emotionally and to connect with other people. And I would say to our higher, deeper source, we need this now more than ever.
Thank you. Uh, we might use to, to, to set the tone for um, a conversation and you can feel free to, you know, use it. Uh, Amanda Kemp is her name, TED Talk, but I'd love to hear your reflections. And so you can run with the mic or I can repeat back what they say just so that the people hear it. Yeah. What do you think? Were there parts of that you liked, parts of that you thought, eh, I'm not buying it? Getting thumbs up in the back. Go ahead. Um, so say, so I hear you saying, talking about how the police behave with the African-American community. Is there a question or is that, and Hispanic community, that, that, is there a question or is that just how, what you took that? Yeah, just what you took from it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's not easy. No. Yes, very controversial. Mm-hmm. In fear. Yeah. Yeah. So it's hard in some ways to maybe hold space for transformation when you're living in that fear. Is that kind of, yeah. Go ahead. I'm going to come to you if that's okay. I think what she said was profound, but I think about using it, say, in an affirmative action situation, like I've worked with the construction industry in regard to getting more people of color into apprenticeships and with. Uh, basically decisions are made by uh, employers and um, people who they uh, are members of their joint apprenticeship committees. One-on-one -on -one is one thing, but in a group, it takes the time required to make such changes are, seem like forever. And uh, that is, and as they say, hope may spring eternal, but people don't have patience forever. And therefore, is, is um, the challenge. Thank you for sharing that. Go ahead. I just had a question about um, what were the three things that she said that she made sure that she checked inside of herself before she was able to engage with that gentleman? Was it like hungry? Uh, what were the other two? Yeah, she said hungry. I am, I just got my mask on. Oh. No, I just, I think she said, Pam, do you remember? She said hungry. She just checked in with herself emotionally. Am I feeling any pain? Do I have space for it? I can't remember the exact words. Yeah, so thinking about, I'm doing kind of a body scan. Like, do I have pain anywhere? Am I feeling frustrated or stressed? Even the kind of the thing that Pam led us through. Like, am I got a lot of tension right now? And I just, I don't have it in me today, you know? So, so thanks. Any other reflections? Oh, sorry. Thank you, Sarah. Well, I think uh, two positive uh, things that I saw in that, in that speech that she said, um, one of them is that it sounded like a lot of what she was talking about, unconditional love, is very um, like parallel to things that like Jesus would preach, you know, about forgiveness and unconditional acceptance. And then the other positive thing I thought was how she uh, gave her coworker space to talk. And a lot of times she was expressing how, as he was saying those things out loud, he was actually starting to question his own ideas. And it was really gracious of her to give him that opportunity to say those things out loud and, you know, kind of hear how dumb some of them sound. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I, I am definitely in agreement that it is about, you know, holding that space, but it, it, that doesn't mean we don't push difficult conversations. We don't have to be patient, you know, like we talked about forever. It doesn't mean we're always, you know, creating comfort um, for everyone. It, it really this, I feel like she comes at it from a place of self-care. Like, am I at a place right now where I want to do this? Uh, it's not about making the other person comfortable. So um, the next thing we're going to shift into is really thinking about this equitable and inclusive or education. And so we have a lot of definitions about trauma-sensitive schools out there. And I couldn't find one that sort of blended both of them. So we we just kind of made this up ourselves. An equitable and inclusive education meets the needs of all students 
in a fair, caring, and respectful, non-discriminatory manner. All students have what they need to succeed in the classroom and beyond. Uh, cultural humility is practiced in the classroom. So I think a lot of the times in, in classrooms in the past, we've talked about uh, cultural diversity, cultural competence. Cultural humility is really the stance of um, that I can never be competent in someone else's culture. No one can ever be competent in that and that they are the expert and the speaker is wise, even if that speaker is a five-year-old child, right? Uh, educators actively seek to understand how bias plays a role in their teaching. This is really in our seven essential ingredients that we're gonna talk about. One of our biggest strategy areas is perspective shift. And for, for me, perspective shift is really about understanding your own bias, the role that plays in your teaching, in your curriculum, in your classroom dynamics, and seeks to eradicate the negative impact that this has on learning. So that's the definition we're working with. I'm gonna turn it over to Pamela here, and she's gonna talk a little bit about the practices that are going on in Milwaukee Public Schools. Thank you, Sarah. So um, as I had mentioned earlier, um, Milwaukee Public Schools has really been committed to really trying to get our district to be trauma sensitive. Um, I'd say that some of this, the process started back in probably 2010, but we um, were able to actually devote a significant amount of time to really having the district go through a, a training series. And so I just kind of wanted to share some of the things that Milwaukee Public Schools is doing to address trauma in our district, because obviously I'm sure many of you know, many of our students unfortunately suffer from many trauma, traumatic um, events in their lives. And so we were able to create a series um, that helped our teachers and our staff members first understand the definition of trauma, just understanding what trauma is, we then wanted to have them begin to focus on self-care because obviously if you're going to be caring for students, you have to first begin with yourself. It kind of goes back to that um, airplane example. You put on your mask first before you start putting on someone else's mask and helping to take care of them. So we needed to have our staff understand the importance of taking care of themselves so that they are able to take care of our students. And then along with that, we also wanted to have some community care. So also having our staffs be able to support one another um, in this process. So we had some restorative um, practices circles that we had our staff to actually participate in um, along with some of their self-care. They actually were able to do a self-care assessment and really create a self-care plan that we often have them revisit on an annual basis. From there, we, in our series, we talked about the impact of trauma. As um, Sarah just talked about a moment ago, um, we had them engage in understanding that perspective shift and really getting them to look at the, the behavior of our students differently. Because a lot of times they wanted to um, blame our students for a lot of things that were going on and didn't really quite understand um, where that behavior might be coming from. Then we talked about what um, the characteristics of a trauma sensitive school were. And one of our big focuses is on social and emotional learning and the importance of actually having explicit instruction for social and emotional learning. So I'm gonna actually talk a little bit about that. And then how we have some tools that we use district wide for social and emotional learning, or we also call it SEL. And so we use um, CASL as our framework and CASL stands for the Collaborative for Academic, Social and Emotional Learning. And when we look at CASL's framework, the um, pie pieces that you see in the middle are really what we are trying to help teach our students. And so that is self-management, self-awareness, social awareness, relationship skills, and then of course, responsible decision-making. And really the um, outer circles are some other areas um, that obviously are impacted as well. So we wanna make sure that we're developing some school-wide practices and policies around SEL, and then how we can have our families and community partners also be engaged with us in that process. So this is kind of one of the tools that we use. 
um, to help our students to really regulate some of their emotions, actually understand their emotions, be able to identify some of their emotions. We use a curriculum in our district called Second Step. And we have this for K kindergarten through um, eighth grade. So all of our, our schools that are kindergarten through eighth grade actually have this curriculum in their school and are supposed to be utilizing it on a regular basis. This is a research-based curriculum that has proven to be very beneficial to many of our staff. It's actually a pretty um, easy to implement. We usually have our teachers to actually implement it with our students. We'll move along. Restorative practices um, is another uh, kind of program that actually just recently um, became a department in our district. So we're real excited about actually having a department in our district that focuses strictly on restorative practices, which is um, a continuum of tools that really helps to intentionally build, maintain, um, restore, as well as repair relationships that may have um, been damaged. We really are focusing on building community within our school, as well as throughout our district. And I won't necessarily go through all of those things that you see up there, but we currently um, have, I believe it's six restorative practices coaches that um, are assigned to a variety of schools. 50% of their time is just really focusing on that specific school on how to create that community. And then they also provide professional development throughout um, the district and supporting our schools in restorative practices. Oh yeah, thank you. Um, mindfulness, which is why we kind of um, started with our mindful moment, is another tool um, that we have been using for our teachers. We um, were blessed to have three vendors that came in to Milwaukee Public Schools to teach our, our teachers and staff about mindfulness and really kind of helping them to be able to be in that present moment to really help them with regulating their own emotions um, and using this kind of as a, a way of taking care of themselves um, as well. So this has been really beneficial and we've actually tried to incorporate mindful moments in most of the training that we do at MPS. We um, have had the opportunity to create a training specifically around de-escalation skills because we have a lot of conflicts, unfortunately, that take place. And many times our staff are not sure of what they can do to kind of help de-escalate or diffuse different situations that happen within the school setting, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's in the hallway, on the playground. Um, so we have a training that our staff are able to actually attend to kind of help give them some of those skills um, to help them to diffuse and de-escalate challenging situations. And really, um, it's really more around kind of using our, our verbal skills versus having to necessarily intervene physically. Because um, we do have our program called CPI that also teaches some verbal escalation um, skills, de-escalation skills, but it also has some physical components as well. But this um, really helps them learn how to de-escalate using words. And we've incorporated really trauma-sensitive um, language into each of our trainings. We have a couple of initiatives that are also um, currently going on. These um, were just introduced more recent, probably within the last two to three years. We um, have what we call our, and they just actually changed the name, so I gotta make sure I get, they, yeah, they just changed, I was like, oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> thanks, it's called the 53206 Promise Partnership Schools Initiative. We had initially called it 53206 Initiative, but now they've added the Promise Partnership component, which um, actually is around community. So the community is actually involved with it as well, focusing specifically on that zip code area. We have what we call trauma support specialists that are assigned to eight schools within that 53206 zip code um, that really support those schools and learning how to be trauma sensitive, um, really trying to again, help those staff members and students 
build community within their um, school system. Along with that, we have what we call a trauma response team that is composed of school two, I think it's two school social workers and two school psychologists that really help within um, that 53206, but they also sometimes are asked to, to actually help in other spots in the district. But it has been um, something I think that has really been beneficial because we've had some unfortunate um, tragedies where they've had to kind of help come and intervene. We recently, like last year recent, um, added what we call trauma care specialist. And we have about six coaches for trauma that are called trauma care specialists that are actually really um, kind of looking at things from a macro level. And so again, teaching our staff and, and supporting our, our staff and students around trauma sensitive schools um, as well. They have a, a kind of a broader range. They don't have just necessarily a single school, but they may have a cohort of schools that they are actually working with. Um, they're centrally located. Um, they really just help to provide resources. Um, some of them provide some trainings and they really kind of um, follow up with some crisis that also may happen. So they kind of have um, a lot of different roles that they have to play. So that is it in a, in a real quick summary. <laughs> Great. So um, yeah, if you have any questions about what, what's going on in Milwaukee Public Schools, um, definitely we'll take those, those questions and Pam can um, answer those. Um, just for the sake of time, I'm going to keep moving. I do have a, a question, though. Can you raise your hand if you do work directly in a school or with a school, coaching a school in some some capacity? So only a couple of you. Okay. So this is about sort of influencing the way in which we um, do this work. And so I'll speak more, more generally about that. Generally, when we talk about trauma and trauma-informed care and kind of the, the progression that's happening in Milwaukee public schools is that we look at... Um, introducing trauma sensitive and then again layering on um, the equity and inclusion work on top of that. Because we want people to have a good foundation of understanding the prevalence of adversity, understanding the impact of that and what it looks like, how it shows up in the classroom, in academics, in behavior. I, talk, I talked about this before that perspective shift is really where we do a lot of work. Uh, really it is about changing minds and hearts. Um, our strategy areas, which we'll just touch on briefly today, a regulation, how do we promote regulation? Um, Pamela talked a little bit about um, some of the strategies we're, we're using, definitely a mindfulness practice, those kinds of things. Relationship, when you talk about restorative practice, that's all about maintaining relationship and connection. And then reason to be. And reason to be is um, really thinking about that sense of purpose, sense of hope, sense of meaning in my life. And then caregiver capacity. We're always, we're always focusing on this. Caregiver capacity is um, when we're supporting educators, our educators' capacity to care. Where is their, their level of stress, their level of regulation so that they can provide that care? So I'm going to run through these ingredients and really sort of talk about how we layer on um, and, and really kind of scaffold. They call it scaffolding learning in, in education. So how many people are familiar with the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study? Okay, a couple of you. So the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, or ACEs, is a study that was done back in the 90s, has been replicated many, many, many times. Um, it's a population study that looks at the prevalence of adversity in people's lives. They took 10 different categories, um, abuse, neglect, household dysfunction, and asked people who are adults now to say had adversity happened to them. So things like, uh, yeah, abuse, neglect, all those kinds of things. Had those things happened to them before the age of 18? What that study has proven again and again is that adversity is common. Adversity is a common experience. It doesn't mean that trauma necessarily is common, but the experience of adversity is common. And I think people have been, have been talking about this triangle here. Um, because I think it's been really, really helpful. I think normally when we talk about a social health problem, we talk about the first, the top three parts of this triangle. Somebody adopts an unhealthy behavior, then they, they develop disease, disability, or social problems, and then they have early death. And then we just attack that adoption of unhealthy behavior. And we say, just don't smoke, just don't drink, just don't eat salty fatty foods, right? And then you won't have these problems. 
what ACES has taught us is that we need to look underneath. That adverse childhood experiences happen in high numbers. Neurodevelopment then gets disrupted. Our brains change in the way we adapt and respond to stress. Then we might get social, emotional, and cognitive impairments. That's when they come to school, right? And so that's why we focus so much on social, emotional learning. And then there was adoption of unhealthy behaviors so that we can cope with those social, emotional, and cognitive. So we make sure that people understand this, that this is the progression, that we need to look lower in the triangle. We need to look at prevention, early intervention. And then we layer on thinking about intergenerational, historical trauma. We, we think about um, that that sometimes is underlying here. Again, then adding in sort of present day racism, oppression, systems of oppression into that conversation so that people are looking at even a more nuanced uh, understanding of the progression about how um, this happens over the life course. We talk about historical trauma, but we do talk about this as not something that happened in the past. One of my um, colleagues at Nurturing Diversity Partners, Fran Campbell, I stole it from her, she loves to say it's baked into the cake the way in which our systems were created. Uh, family, it lives on in family beliefs, values, traditions. I don't think I need to tell this group in institutional practices, in our schools, in child welfare, in law enforcement, in our structures, in our cultural norms, and in present day racism. So this is, you know, when people talk about, and a lot of people approach this work by giving, you know, really making sure we're giving accurate historical perspective on the adversities that have happened to groups of people. And I think that that is really important. But when people say, well, that happened so long ago, or that happened, um, that's something in the past, we talk about how it's baked into the cake. Or some people say it's the water we swim in, the air we breathe. I like the cake. I don't know, maybe I'm just I'm cake. I have a cake bias. Anyway, <laughs> and then we talk about uh, COVID-19 as a multiplier. Again, I don't think I need to, to belabor that, that we all have seen. Um, health disparities for our uh, people of color, uh, you know, employment issues, digital divide, all of the things that um, have been happening during our, this pandemic that have, um, you know, really underscored these disparities. So I told you perspective shift was the, the main work of it. This is, uh, if anybody's ever seen saying they do, do trauma informed care, we love this image. Um, I love to bring it to you because it's a little bit of an interactive thing. So uh, why don't we raise your hand if you're looking at this image and she is uh, spinning in a clockwise fashion. We're kind of to the right. Okay. Oh, it's all this half of the room. Counterclockwise. She's going back and forth for you. Anybody else? Oh, a couple people. Does she just keep going back and forth? She switch. She switch. Can you yell out switch when you see your switch? So she's switching. Not for you. So she's not switching at the same time for everybody. Now she just switched. She is crafty. Anybody else? Anybody stuck one way? Yeah, I'm clockwise all day, every day. Um, and I just say that's because I'm inflexible and there's only one right way. No. So, so some people, can, anybody that can make her switch got a tip for somebody else, like where you look or what you do? Say it louder. Sorry. You count it? Okay, she's counting it while she's looking at it. And then it just counts at a certain switch. For you. Some people say, look at the feet, look at the extended arm, the heels. Does that help anybody? Now it doesn't mean that you haven't accomplished something if you uh, didn't, you know, couldn't make her switch. Pam, which way did she, did she go for you? She switch? She's clockwise all the time. That's because you and I are the same. It's not easy, right? So why I use this image is because perspective shift um, is so important. It is um, what I say about this is that some saw clockwise, some saw counterclockwise some saw her switch, um, the image is always the same, right? So the difference is not in her, it's in us. And so I often use this with educators to say, how we view a student and a student's behavior has as much to do with us as it has to do with them, right? We influence what we see. 
if you want to, you know, study this and look at it later, I always caution people don't Google um, dancing spinning girl. That's not the one you want to, you don't know what you're going to get. Um, I, it's ballerina optical illusion, or at least don't Google that at work, right? So, um, yeah, so thinking about this, so we, uh, when we're talking to educators, we, we talk about this right away. What have you heard? What have you said? What have you thought in your own perspective? That was so long ago. Everybody can get, you know, can, has equal opportunity if they work hard. We hear this one a lot. I've had trauma. I've had challenges too. I've had bad things happen in my life and I just made good choices, right? People thinking in a binary fashion, like I'm not racist. You either are racist or you aren't. Um, sign, I signed up for this job to help children. That was a little bit more of a nuanced one, but that can be about some of our educators, particularly our white educators who maybe have kind of a little bit of a savior thing, right? I, I, I'm choosing to work in the city. I am doing noble work and people aren't appreciating that, right? So what else have we heard? I've heard this because I work in schools across the country. We don't need to talk about this. All of our students are white or we don't need to talk about this because all of our students are black, right? Or students of color. So have you heard any of these? Yeah, probably more. Definitely the first one. So we talk about this from the way I come at it is, is a way of thinking about bias. So all the ways that bias is happening. Am I running out of time? I'm talking too much. Uh, all the ways of bias is happening. So we talk about confirmation bias, that we, our brain, brains are wired in a way that takes in information that confirms what we already believe to be true. I was telling Pam about a story that happened on the way in here. So I walked in to the front door of the Wisconsin Center and the man said to me, the guy at the front desk or whatever, the, the podium, what was it? She loves color. And I'm like, excuse me? She loves color? Yes, what? What are you saying? And he's like, the conference, she loves colors. Is that what you're here for? I'm like, no, no, someone on poverty. He's like, oh, upstairs. So I was curious about that. And I went upstairs and I started listening to him. And he said, other, another group walked in. And he said, Van Gogh? Yes, they went up to the Van Gogh exhibit. A man walked in. Someone on poverty? Yes, he walked in. So I had to, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, wow, that's a perfect example of bias. Like he's using his bias of who he thinks that person is here to see or what they're here. So I went and looked up, she loves color, and apparently it's a scrapbooking conference. So what about me and my white middle age self says I love scrapbooking, but apparently that's what it says. Everything about me says, you, you look like you are gonna go to a scrapbooking conference. So I'll try not to be offended. <laughs> but anyway, but maybe that's, maybe I need to do some self-reflection. Anyway, um, so bias is true. And bias can play a role in trauma. We wanna make sure that we are careful about that because that's one of the biases I see right now is that I will go to a suburban school and I hear about mental health and I go to an urban school and I hear about trauma. And I hear people say things like high trauma school or he's a trauma kid, right? So even though I talk about trauma all the time, I want us to be mindful that we could be doing harm if we are labeling kids because Teachers' expectations highly correlate with um, actual achievement. And so if we are teaching educators that um, trauma makes you unable to achieve, which is not what we're teaching, but if that's their takeaway, we could be doing harm. I think I'm gonna turn this one, can you do this one? Yeah, are you willing to or you want me to just do it? Okay, so this is, this is in the restorative practice and stuff, that's why I threw a pam for that. This is really about how do we aim for this upper right hand corner. So we have high support, low support, high challenge, low challenge. In the low challenge, low support school, there's little learning happening. If we up the game and have a bunch of challenge, but we don't support kids, they're going to feel stress. What people worry that we're asking for when we do this is this over here, low challenge and high support. So we just kind of lower the bar for kids. And if you've had a rough time, then you get to sleep all day. And that is exactly the opposite of what we're looking for. We really are, when we're doing our restorative practice work, but even our trauma sensitive and equitable work, we're looking for this upper right hand corner. Supporting kids the best they can, we can to meet the high challenges. And understanding bias from this perspective. Can it be true 
that two things aren't happening. That I love and care for all of my students, and I want what's best for them, and I also have bias that may be impacting my practice, that may be harmful to some students. That's what we're trying to get people to um, acknowledge and recognize. You can still be, have good intentions and have bias that are harming. So we ask often um, people to say, what would it take to create what we call a call-in culture, where um, colleague to colleague, we can go into each other's classrooms and say, observe me. Who do I call on the most? Whose name do I say most often? And is that in a positive way or a negative way? Who gets disciplined the most? Whose ideas are affirmed or paid attention to? And whose ideas are invalidated? And where are microaggressions happening? If you wanna look it up, a lot of this call in culture work happens, um, comes from a school in Visitation Valley, California, where they talk a lot about dismantling white supremacy culture in their school. And this is where this call in culture came from. But I ask you to think about that, about what it would take in your school, in my school, to create this. There would have to be trust. There'd have to be vulnerability. There'd have to be risking psychological safety in order for, for greater things to happen. So regulation is our next ingredient. We're not gonna go into detail in that. And again, if you wanna reach out to me or give me your name, I can send you tools and resources on how we promote regulation in the brain. Um, I think that when we talk about bias, one of the things that the video talked about and that we talk about often is this element of fear, that when we are in fear or exhaustion, we're in the lowest part of our brain, and the part of our brain that's in charge of our highest thinking isn't running the show. And so often a lot of our strategies are around regulation. But I'm going to throw it back to Pam here to talk a little bit about relationship. I know we're running short on time, but um, you can do it. I believe in you. You're real fast. All right, and so we know that um, relationships are really one of the foundational ingredients for really helping our students to thrive. So when we have student-to-student -student relationships, our adult-to-student relationships, this is what really kind of helps to create a healthy environment for our, our students as well as our staff. Um, a school really that prioritizes positive and healthy and collaborative relationships between a variety of people. So it doesn't matter what their age is, their gender, their background, their ethnicity, um, helping to really try to understand each individual person really can help us to break down some of those barriers so that we'd, we can really kind of eliminate some of those biases that we often see. Um, some of those fears and misconceptions about people, because when we start to understand people and get to know people for who they are and not have all those assumptions, that is what helps us to create um, a healthy environment. And it really does help us to begin to dismantle um, some of that racism and instill an understanding in valuing differences amongst different people. You, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Click it over to the next side. So for us to begin to do that, we have to begin by looking at ourselves first. So just looking in, inward. We want to really um, do a, a cultural inventory of ourselves, maybe by asking some of these questions, like what are important aspects of our identity? What, what is our culture? And what are some things that you find that are denied? And what are some of the privileges that we have? Because we all do have um, privileges. We want to examine what those privileges are um, and how that might contribute to our current identity. We want to make sure that we also commit ourselves to being a learner first. Learning about that student before we create policies. Really wanting to include our students in kind of some of those policies that we do create in our classrooms. Having them to kind of come up with some of the, the rules or expectations um, in the classroom, because when you can get their buy-in, they're more likely to adhere to whatever we all come up with um, together. We want to be adaptable in our lesson planning um, to change to fit that student. Again, if we can get our, our students involved in that process, I think, again, it helps to create that community for our children. Um, diversity in one's own life. Um, who and what are we exposed to? I remember doing um, an activity real quick that we had to identify like 
things like who our, our doctor was, um, who do we typically hang out with on the weekends, um, who are the people that we see when we go to the grocery store. It was, it was an interesting activity that we um, all did. It, you really kind of could see how much diversity you actually did have in your life um, if there was any diversity. And then conditioning impacts on you as an educator. What have you been told about certain types of students? And of course, we always are hearing about those naughty students. Um, and we often define students by some of the behaviors that we see. We don't necessarily look at maybe what's happening behind that behavior, what's causing this behavior. We will label a student. I know in, in MPS, we're very good at doing a lot of labels, um, which unfortunately doesn't really give often a fair assessment to our students. So again, really building that relationship and understanding our students is really important. Um, what past experiences with certain types of students may have created a bias? Um, if you had a student who obviously was not very respectful, um, then you may, of course, when you see students who maybe look like that person or act like that person, you will create a certain bias um, about maybe that type of um, individual. Again, one of the things uh, we often talk about in one of the other trainings that I do is called Q-TIP, and Q-TIP stands for quit taking it personally. So we don't wanna always take everything that somebody says or does very personally, because a lot of times it's not even about us, um, but unfortunately we tend to take it that way. So nothing else, remember Q-TIP, quit taking it personally. Um, you can move to the next slide, okay. And so just looking around, um, we've talked a lot about restorative practices and we really wanna, if we can adopt the restorative practice philosophy versus being punitive, we tend to want to be punitive and punish kids and make them pay for whatever wrong they have done in restorative practices. We really want to have some, our students or even our staff members to really repair that harm that was done. So being, holding um, those students or staff members accountable. And again, having that, what we call high accountability as well as high support. Um, culturally responsive teaching, something that we often, of course, in the NPS, really um, try to, to model and, and, and to promote um, our awareness, uh, learning partnerships, information processing, and of course, that community building is very key. We wanna have um, that collaborative, um, I guess, disposition versus thinking we're expert-based ex education, because we often do that as well. Um, I know, I see, I see that um, when we have IEP meetings, um, sometimes that can come through real clear and we're not necessarily being as collaborative. We come from that stance that we know what's best for the student. And when we have families and parents um, that are a part of that process, we wanna make them feel a part of the process and to help in that decision-making process. And to me, that's what collaborative is being um, versus we thinking we know what's best for your kid. Um, skills to work in a multicultural world are prioritized. That's definitely something that we wanna make sure um, that we do is really help to obviously build those skills. We want to admire and appreciate what others bring to the table. And so by being multicultural and prioritizing that um, and diversity in just in general, I think is, is, is very key. And I know I'm taking up too much time. About two minutes. <laughs> we just over plan as always. Um, so again, just in our last few minutes here, I, I think that if you want some takeaways, if you're in a position to influence your school, the school that you um, your child uh, um, attends, think about these kinds of questions. What group in your school is not being celebrated? We talk a lot about thinking about the value of difference and that difference actually, you know, in all the research says that when you have diverse teams, not just diverse racially, diverse by age, by gender, by the experience, you come up with bigger, better solutions. Are we preparing our students for that? So what school, what group is not being celebrated? Are we just trying to assimilate? What's the problem or challenge? How does white cultural norms influence this um, perspective? And how can we see something that might be viewed as a challenge, as a strength? And always, you know, taking it back to the TED talk in the beginning, always checking in with our own capacity, you know, shifting to silence um, in case I say something wrong, having a savior complex, checking yourself in that place, or if you're in a place of exhaustion, 
or emotional tax, that it is just not something I can take on today. Take, um, take that space, take those moments. And then always be willing to do the journey. This is what we ask people when we're working with educators to do, is to have the courage to go first, to point something out, to say something, to um, temporarily risk your own psychological safety, to do the work, read, self-reflect, don't let, you know, let anger, shame, frustration, it's part of it, it's tough. And so just expect that as part of the conversation. Engage in the discussion, make a commitment and put that commitment into action. And so we are out of time here, but we will hang out here in the end. If you have any questions or thoughts for us, or if people have questions, you can feel free to ask them now. We'll stay longer. This is just information, Pam and my contact information, and then some networking sessions that we have coming up. But um, thank you, as I always, and enjoy the, I think you're done, aren't you, unless you're going to the meeting? Is this the last session? Okay, a virtual question is coming in. How do you address trauma in a school setting? minute conversation but um a lot of what we do in uh for addressing trauma in a school setting um we we do definitely look at the what we call in schools the universal so culture and climate what we're doing for everyone creating relationships like pam was talking about but we also look at regulatory practices healing practices and then many of our schools are also partnering with mental health supports too so there's school embedded uh, mental health supports and really getting people the support and help that they need so but we also, you know, we talk a lot in schools about clinical services are great, but I bet if I asked each one of you to name, you know, kind of how people make it, you're going to say that great coach or that teacher or somebody who cared about me. Um, and so it really does happen through healing happens through everyday interactions. And that's what we're trying to give educators, the capacity to create healing in everyday interactions with students. So any other thoughts? Did you guys look into or follow any other other models in the United States that schools are following? The question is, how is it making an impact? Um, well, what I have seen in um, MPS is that our teachers are beginning to really grasp an understanding of trauma. And because of that, I believe they're starting to, to have a little bit um, better um, relationships with their students trying to connect with their students, trying to really to build that community and creating, um, even we've had some spaces within some of our schools for when students may be having a difficult time, they, they actually have a space that they can go to like, kind of like calm down. Oftentimes we're promoting those spaces within just the classroom setting so that they don't necessarily have to have the student leave the classroom, but to be able to be within the classroom. And if they need some regulation time, they, they have a space we might have it a peace corner or whatever they might want to call it and having some tools. So I've seen a lot of um, schools that have developed this for their classrooms and having those tools and teaching their students how to use those tools within the classroom so that they can get back to that learning process as, as quickly as possible. 
I think and all of this too is because we teach a lot about the brain and how the brain responds to those regulation practices and not necessarily when you're under stress, a sort of reward and consequence. So what we're working on and our goals are around reducing exclusionary dif discipline, suspension, expulsion, those kinds of punitive things that then we know is part of the prison pipeline, right? It's part of how um, that works. And so, and I think one of the powerful things that we're doing too is teaching kids about what is regulating for them. So I don't know about you as adults, sometimes we get into our adult life and we don't even really understand what frustrates us or what makes it better. So how powerful would it be if we graduated kids who knew, you know, how many kids are, or people are in prison because there was no moment between feeling and response, right? And so if we're giving kids the tools that, yep, when I have big feelings, here's some stuff I can do about it. So that's kind of our impact. All with a secondary goal, like you said, of having people being able to access learning, which is what education is all about. So, thank you. All right, guys, at this time, this concludes our discussion. If you have any further questions, you're more than welcome to stay behind, and Pamela and Sarah will definitely answer them for you. But on behalf of SDC, and the Poverty Summit, we would like to say thank you. Thank you for all the informative information that you have given us. We appreciate you and we look forward to hearing from you in the future.